Why wasn't Christopher Columbus Chinese? That idea might sound ridiculous, but actually it is not. Because for a while it looked like China was poised to conquer the world and become the leading figure of the modern age. And that did not happen. Why? We'll study that today on Professor Jerome's World History's Greatest Hits. In a previous video, we talked about what I call the non-rise of the non-West, meaning that in the 15th, 16th, 1700s, a number of European powers, Spain, later the Netherlands, Britain, France, kind of grew to world prominence, uh, both in terms of exploration, conquest, commerce, or just intellectual achievements, what is called the rise of the West by scholars. But a question I find quite interesting is the non-rise of the non-West, meaning why other countries didn't do the same thing. Uh, we had a previous video on those Muslim empires in India and Turkey, the Ottomans and the Mughals. Today I want to focus on another candidate for world domination, and that would have been China under the Ming and later the Qing dynasty. What was special about China on the eve of the modern world? During that period, China would be ruled first by the Ming dynasty, uh, 1368 to 1644, and then a transition to the Qing dynasty, also known as the Manchu dynasty, uh, 1644 up until 1911. This uh, would be considered a kind of a golden age for China. Uh, they started from a very strong perspective. For one thing, they would be strong militarily, able to push out the previous Mongol invaders and build the famous Wall of China to defend themselves. And you have a series of technological achievements if you want to measure the Ming Dynasty based more on their brains. Many of the inventions uh, that we uh, associate with the modern world would have originated in China either during the Ming Dynasty or some of their predecessors, from uh, printing uh, to paper to gunpowder uh, to modern ships that have watertight compartments and a rudder and a compass, all the tools that could be used for building a wall or a maritime technology uh, were generally invented in China during the Ming dynasty or their predecessors. Another way to measure the strengths of a country would be uh, through the strength of their economy. Uh, most of the people of China would have been farmers, obviously, as was the case of most pre-modern societies, uh, but you also had merchants who could capitalize on exports of uh, farming products or agricultural products. Uh, things like uh, tea, uh, like porcelain, like silk, uh, would be in high demand uh, all around the world and would be exported uh, through Southeast Asia by sea or through Central Asia, the Middle East, and ultimately Europe through the Silk Road. Uh, China, by contrast, imported very few things. It was pretty self-sufficient. So what do you do in that case if you export products and you don't import much in result? In return, well, you uh, run a surplus of the balance of trade and the other people have to pay you the difference in cash, uh, usually silver. So uh, all the people today who complain about how uh, there's a huge trade deficit with China, well, it's, a new, it's not a new problem. It went back centuries. Uh, another way in which European powers during the rise of the West became uh, rich was through exploration. And in that regard, uh, China had uh, quite an early start. Uh, you may or may not have heard of the great fleets of Admiral Zheng He in the early 1400. Uh, Deng He has an amazing story. He began as a young Muslim boy in the western reaches of China. He uh, was uh, captured in western China, and many of his uh, relatives were killed. He himself was enslaved and actually castrated as a young boy. He became what is called a, a eunuch, a castrated slave, uh, which was often used in the Ming Dynasty uh, to make bureaucrats for the, uh, for the empire, because they could not reproduce and so could not be a threat to the emperor. So really uh, not an easy start to his life. Uh, but he became friend with one of the great emperors of the Ming period, Yong Lei, and they kind of grew up together. And when Yong Lei became the emperor, Zheng He became his uh, trusted second. And specifically, Yong Lei was a bit of a rebel for his time, and he was far more willing to look outside of China than uh, the people who came before him or after him. And he sponsored seven great fleets of exploration. Uh, that left from China under the rule of Admiral Zheng He, his childhood friend slash slave, uh, whom he sent on explorations of Southeast Asia all the way to India or uh, Africa. Uh, exploration, quote unquote, because many of these areas would already have been known to the Chinese. Uh, so the goal is uh, knowledge, reconnoiter areas that you might not too well, know too well, 
uh, but also power projection. Those fleets were massive, so, and they sent troops alongside, so it's a way to prove to others, be careful, don't mess with China, maybe even pay tribute uh, to China. And also a desire to import some goods, uh, especially rare goods that might not be known in China, things like a giraffe, for example, which according to Chinese mythology looks a bit like a uh, kind of a magical animal and that will bring good luck to the reign of who, whichever emperor would have that in the Imperial Zoo in Beijing. Uh, so these voyages were massive. The largest ships in the fleet were called treasure ships, uh, nine masted ships, as I recall, just absolute behemoths, way, way larger than what Christopher Columbus sailed on his first voyage. And where the voyage of Christopher Columbus in 1492 would involve their just three ships, the fleets of Zhang He would involve 300 ships. Those fleets uh, started as early as 1405, and the voyages lasted until 1435. And for that reason, there would be about 100 years, give or take, before the great voyages of the Spanish and the Portuguese explorers, Vasco da Gama, Magellan, or Columbus. Uh, so China would have a great head start, technological advances, uh, ships, a navy, you name it, you would think that they ought to be the one to have colonized the New World. And in fact, there's a book that claims that, 1421 is the title, uh, which claims, based on pretty uh, sparse evidence, uh, that some Chinese explorers got to Central America uh, decades before Christopher Columbus ever did. It's more of an out there theory, and not all scholars are convinced. Uh, so classified under the column of maybe, question mark, question mark. Uh, the Ming eventually uh, gave rise to the Qing dynasty, or Manchu dynasty, uh, they're called the Manchu dynasty because their rulers were Manchu, who are not ethnically Chinese, they're not Han. Uh, they come from the northern part of China, they're Manchu, kind of related to the Mongols, and would be seen by a lot of the Chinese as being outsiders. And they remain quite distinct uh, throughout their history. The Manchu were quite self-aware of the fact that they were a small group trying to rule a much larger Han majority, and so that the Manchu tried to stay apart and not become too uh, absorbed by the vast Han majority. Uh, so intermarriage was frowned upon, the Manchu preserved their own language, which was unknown uh, to the majority of the Han Chinese who spoke Mandarin or uh, Cantonese Chinese, and so uh, uh, they remained distinct from the rest of the population. Uh, in many ways, the Manchu kind of built upon what came before, even though they're outsiders, they embraced a lot of the culture of China, including uh, Confucianism, which goes back to Kung Fu Tzu or Confucius, uh, that philosophers from roughly 500 BC. Uh, those ideas have really shaped uh, China, uh, such as the notion that you should respect your ruler. It's a very conservative ideology looking up to the top. And uh, also uh, Confucianism respects uh, learning. Scholars and bureaucrats such as, well, I'm a professor and a public servant, would be considered the best people in society. So he got that one right. Uh, so for that reason, there would be a lot of respect uh, for uh, learning. And both during the Ming dynasties is an effort to gather up a huge encyclopedia called the Yangle Encyclopedia. And then during the Qing dynasty, uh, people continue that effort into learning. One of the great emperors of the Qing dynasty would be called the Kangxi Emperor. And one of his achievements was to gather up a dictionary of Chinese that assembled all the uh, characters of Chinese uh, called the Kangxi Dictionary. So a big focus on learning, which helped uh, with development of uh, technology and intellectual achievements. On the other hand, Confucianism had a less appealing aspect. It is based on the notion of utility, uh, that in society there are better people than others based on how useful they are to society. So at the top you put scholars and bureaucrats because to Confucius uh, they brought learning, which is key, and also the smooth functioning of a society. The emperor, uh, his eunuchs, they are the ones who make the country function, and if you don't have that, you have civil war, you have chaos, that's what Confucius knew in his lifetime, and you can't have a prosperous society. So they're at the top. And next would be farmers, because they're the ones who feed you, and if you don't eat, well, you die, so they're pretty close to the top. And just a step below would be um, kind of useful craftsmen. People make tools uh, that would be useful for you, like the chair that I'm sitting on, or uh, the camera I'm using. On the other hand, anything that is not tangible uh, would be more frowned upon. For example, a merchant is not considered a producer because uh, he or she just gets a can of peas, puts a label on it, uh, marks up the price by 20%, and resells the exact same can of peas. So professions like being an actor or an athlete or a lawyer, uh, which tend to be well regarded and well paid in the US today because they pay a lot, and our social structure is based on money, not usefulness. 
uh, well, those professions would be poorly regarded by Confucius and Chinese society in general because uh, they did not produce anything tangible. Or in the case of a lawyer, they produce conflict, suing people. Uh, this would be going against the very purpose of a Confucian philosophy, which is all about creating harmony and a smooth, well-functioning uh, society. Uh, soldiers would definitely be at the bottom because they have a negative kind of production uh, to destroy stuff instead of producing them. So all these uh, would be a kind of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it would help create a very well centralized empire that would be extremely well run uh, with a bureaucracy that would be the envy of the world. Uh, those uh, bureaucrats during the era of the Ming or later the, the Qing would be selected through a grueling multi-day examination where you would prepare for years and usually learn about the text of Confucius. That's the main part of the curriculum and then write what were called eight-legged essays, endless essays, about the writing of Confucius and how they would apply uh, to government. And if you were successful at that, then you would, might become a Mandarin or one of the top bureaucrats based on merit, not connection, and uh, that would make the Chinese bureaucracy the best in the world. So by those standards, an emperor like, say, Kang Xin would have been a very great success. He ruled for a long time, 61 years altogether, and then later on his grandson had also an extremely long reign, so a long period of stability. He did some war, but only to some extent, just to kind of preserve uh, the outer layer of China, whether it's in Tibet or Vietnam or Mongolia or Taiwan. And beyond that, you just focus on the uh, intellectual development of China, the Kangxi Dictionary, and the development of the population. And there, the Chinese emperors were kind of lucky in that this was the after effects of the colonial exchange. At that time, and all these crops were introduced uh, from the Americas to Europe and eventually making all their way to China. And because of all the new crops of American origin making their way to China, uh, that helped push the Chinese population up. So all that is kind of a positive development. On the other hand, you can look at Confucianism with a different lens that it tends to have so much focus on order and stability and respect for tradition and all people uh, that you don't have that kind of creative chaos uh, that is at the source of democracy or capitalism or progress in general. If you tell your young people uh, the way to succeed in life is to study Confucius, a writer from you know, 2000 years before, and just learning everything by heart and write that eight-legged essay according to a very strict format, and never challenge any of the preconceived ideas because you will be judged based on how closely you stick to the ideas of Confucius, you're not promoting innovative learning. And that uh, kind of stifled intellectual life in, in China up until the 19th century. A key example in that regard would be the fate of those expeditions that I talked about earlier. Uh, where Yang Lei died, and he was a bit of a rebel who didn't follow the Confucian lobby, established Confucian traditions, reasserted themselves in the late Ming Dynasty and later the Qing Dynasty. And among the fact that they stopped doing those voyages of exploration and power projection. Uh, you have seven voyages and there's an end to it. That's a big difference between those voyages and those by Spain, Portugal and others. Uh, they come to an end. Plus in a way there's a sense of complacency that they were so advanced that they figure what is there to be learned from all these barbarians outside of China. And barbarians is a term that they use. Uh, that China is the center of the world, the middle kingdom as they called it. So the result is that after those voyages came to an end, all the great treasure ships uh, were moss bold and you even had some rules uh, telling Chinese nationals uh, you should not be building large ocean-going vessels. If you do that, you might even face a death penalty. And there was an effort to start looking inward. You might do a commerce inside China uh, on the Grand Canal or by the side of the coast, uh, but don't go and explore America or all the way to Africa or Europe. Instead, you had British and Portuguese ships coming to the coast of China and not the other way around. China is still proper, prospered through trade, but you can see how they missed out on quite a bit of the profits or just the attempt to colonize the rest of the world. No attempt also to conquer, which could be ruthless and murderous. Um, and here these Spanish conquistadors are not nice guys, but as far as the development of uh, Spain, the fact that you have conquistadors willing to invade the Aztec Empire or the Inca Empire, uh, that they are very military in nature, uh, would lead to great profits for Spain. In that sense, China quite literally missed the boat. Uh, also important in the Confucian idea is the notion that uh, children, especially uh, firstborn sons, are supposed to care for their parents. If uh, you do war or long distance commerce, you leave your village and go far away, and in a way you're being a bad son because you're not there to care for your parents in old age, 
to good thought, it's great, uh, but sometimes you need to have a, a bit of a prodigal son in society, one who abandons everybody to try to do great things, if that society is ever to change. So here's a society that you had under the Qing uh, as of, say, the early 1700s. The largest population in the world, a proud tradition of scholarship, a powerful military but underused, a knowledge of the outside world but a lack of interest, a very stable society due to Confucianism but also kind of complacent and static, and a uh, leadership, the Manchu, uh, were a bit insecure about their spot because they are a minority within the Chinese population and they try not to rock the boat too much, not to intermarry with a hand Chinese or not to introduce any new things. Uh, that meant that China, by and large, was on the receiving end of the age of exploration as opposed to uh, being branching outward. So uh, by the 1500s, the Portuguese had discovered ways to get to India and later China, and uh, merchants from Portugal and then later other countries like Britain uh, showed up in China by sea. Uh, what is it that motivates so is these explorers? It's always the three Gs, right? Gold, God, and glory, uh, with profit and religion being at the forefront. Uh, well, that's true also in the European exploration uh, of uh, China. People that come might be Jesuit missionaries. The Jesuit order is a group of people from the Catholic Church uh, created after the Protestant Reformation as a way to combat the, threat, the spread of uh, Protestant ideas. Uh, soldiers of Christ, that's how they would see them. Uh, very active in educational circles. Here in Louisiana, we have uh, things like Loyola University or Francis Xavier University. Uh, but also very active in uh, missionary activities, trying to convert the heathens to the Catholic branch of Christianity before some Protestant missionary did that. Uh, so a number of Jesuits uh, went uh, to China, went to uh, Japan, among them the famous uh, Francis Xavier, uh, hoping to convert people away from Shinto, Buddhism, or Islam, and towards Christianity. Uh, China was always a big target because it's such a large population, and, but also when you have only a handful of uh, missionaries for such a large population, you really can't convert everybody. Uh, so the idea was to get straight to the top, to the emperor, and convert him, and hopefully with China being so top-down, everybody else uh, would follow. Uh, you do need to be uh, granted an audience uh, with the emperor of China, not an easy feat. So the way that the missionaries often tried to approach Chinese emperors would be to bring uh, items of novelty that were unknown in China. Uh, specifically some of the more modern clocks that were starting to come out in Europe. So you bring a fancy clock as a gift, and when you're admitted into the uh, imperial household, uh, now you have an excuse to shift the topic toward uh, conversion. Uh, the Jesuits came very, very close to uh, converting one of the Chinese emperors, but failed due to uh, controversy over uh, the cult of the ancestors. It was common, and it's kind of inspired from Confucian ideas, uh, that in China you would respect not only your ancestors while they were alive, but also after they passed away. And every year you would go back to the cemetery and then make offerings to your ancestors, and they would be kind of spirits or ghosts presiding over the family and protecting you. Uh, the question was, well, is it just respect for ancestors? Uh, something a bit similar like All Saints Day that you do have in the Catholic Church, or is it actually more polytheistic and a cult of uh, spirits or of gods? Uh, the missionaries in China were willing to accept that right, uh, but they had to get approval from the Pope first, and the Pope were adamant that, no, uh, if you want to be a true Catholic, you have to abandon uh, all these Confucian traditions, uh, including the worship of ancestors. That's a form of polytheism. So it was interesting to know, uh, you know how, what might have been if history had unfolded in a different way, if one of the Chinese emperors had converted to Catholicism and all his followers had followed along. Uh, but we'll never know. The other main motivator for people to come to China would be greed, commerce. So these would be merchants, not missionaries. What did they come to buy? Well, mostly tea, porcelain, silk, spices, ginger, all of which would be in great demand in Europe. On the other hand, they didn't have that much to sell into uh, China. So they would have to pay the difference in silver or precious bullion until some British merchants in the 18th, 19th centuries figure out why don't we sell drugs into China, specifically everything related to opium. So you would grow that in Southeast Asia or India, uh, ship it to China, and that would mean that finally the British had something to sell into China, with great success. Sons and daughters who spend their time in the opium den, they would neglect their parents, the children, do none of their filial duties that are so important 
and entire families will be ruined or broken because of that a kind of similar problem that we face in the US today uh, because of the opioid epidemic. So that's the situation in China as of the 19th century. A group of rulers, uh, the Qing, that are influenced by tradition, pretty good at keeping China the way it is, uh, but not so good at kind of improving and changing and adapting to the modern world. Uh, in the long run, that meant a decline of China relative to the rest of the world. Uh, there was still a large population, and fairly rich, uh, but as the rest of the world, especially Britain, with the Industrial Revolution surged ahead, as a share of the world economy, uh, the Chinese share uh, declined. You can look at the graph of the overall world GDP and you notice that the share of China in the 1800s uh, starts declining compared to Britain. Same thing with technology. Uh, the steam engine, the modern guns that appear in Europe are not quite imitated in China as of yet. So that created an imbalance uh, where clearly some problems started to appear in China by the 19th century. It's the time of their decline. Uh, problems related to opium, uh, but also domestic rebellion. Specifically, at some point, you have a huge rebellion uh, in South Central China called the Taiping Rebellion that went on for years and years and years. That rebellion was eventually uh, put down, but not until something like 20 million peasants either starved to death or were killed. The death toll was enormous, one of the greatest catastrophes of world history. In order to kind of uh, restore uh, a semblance of uh, family order, the uh, Manchu started to try to limit uh, the opium consumption, which is within their sovereign right to do, right? It's a country and they want to restrict uh, the use of opium. So banning imports of opium by the British and the consumption of opium within China. Uh, the British were not too pleased with that because they were making quite a bit of money, finally had a surplus of trade with China and would not let go of the opium exports. Uh, that led to two wars with China called the Opium Wars, and if you think of the war on drugs in the US today, it's the exact opposite. It's not a war to prevent drugs from being imported on the part of Britain. It's a war to allow the continued import of drugs into China, while the Chinese themselves are trying to protect themselves. Uh, you would think that Britain, a fairly small island, fighting a war on the other side of the world at home in Chinese waters would be at a disadvantage. But by that point, the 1830s, 1840s is when those wars were fought. Uh, China would have been quite behind, especially in terms of maritime technology. Remember that they abandoned their plans of fleets in the 1400s, 400 years before. And the result was a rout where the British were successful and were able to impose a treaty on China that forced them to continue importing opium. This was the first of many unequal treaties. That's how they're called in China. Treaties imposed at uh, gunpoint, in a way, or gunboat point. Gunboats being those battleships that European powers would send in Asian waters. Uh, sometimes people refer to that whole era too as gunboat diplomacy, which was pretty common in the 19th century, where European powers tried to bully uh, weaker, less technologically advanced uh, countries into signing treaties that were a disadvantage to them. Uh, what kind of unequal treaty do you have? Well, obviously uh, those connected to the opium wars. Others that might allow uh, foreign merchants uh, or diplomats to live in an area of the city, say Shanghai or uh, Beijing, uh, that would be off limits to the Chinese police. They would be called Western concessions, Western quarters. And in those areas, people would have their own stamps, their own currency, their own schools, their own police force. And there's kind of a barrier around it. And it's an enclave of uh, foreigners living within China, and they're off limits to the Chinese government. As if, you know, Chinatown in Manhattan today in the U.S was actually run by the Chinese government and the U.S. police had no right to enter Chinatown. You would see how that would be seen in the U.S. as a major uh, assault to American sovereignty on its own soil. Well, that's the way it was in China. Ultimately, some foreign powers were able to get not just concessions to a quarter of the city, but the entire city. Uh, places like uh, Macau for Portugal or Hong Kong to Britain and remain in uh, foreign hands up until the late 1990s. And ultimately, some foreign powers started to have uh, zones of uh, greater economic interest, where they'll say that area of northern China that's close to Russia will be an exclusive zone of economic interest to the Russians, or that area will maybe be more dominated by German interest, French, British interest. Not quite outright colonization, but you could see how things keep creeping in, and that ultimately, uh, if you've given a portion of a city, then an entire city, and then a zone of of economic interest in a region, uh, ultimately China might be split apart and colonized, which is pretty common in the 19th century. That's the era of colonization. The leader of China, one of the last rulers of the Manchu dynasty, uh, was the lady that you see on the book over there. Her name was Sixi or Tsuhi, depending on how you transcribe her Manchu name. Uh, 
Uh, generally, she's presented as an example of the decline of the latter rulers, that she was old, uh, ineffective, and incompetent, and that's part of the general decline of the Manchu dynasty. Uh, the biography I'm reading right now uh, tends to be far more positive about her and sees her as a more modern figure. Uh, one, for example, would try to ban uh, death by a thousand cuts, which was a terrible torture inflicted by the Chinese whenever you killed your king or your father or mother. Uh, so that gets us into a larger debate on history as to how you come up with conclusion history about how the past unfolded. Uh, the way I presented in a lecture is pretty straightforward. This happened and that happened and that happened and I speak with a voice of certainty. This is how the past unfolded. And that's the vision that most people have of history, that it's pretty clear cut. The reality is when you start to look at how the sausage is, the sausage is made, uh, things get a bit messier. And in fact, the way historians present the past change over time is called historiography. How historians' view of the past has changed over, over the long run. Uh, this can change based on new documents coming to the fore. Earlier I mentioned how there are different theories on whether the Chinese might have visited uh, America before Columbus did or not. In that case, you decide that based on the evidence. Uh, but sometimes you have the evidence, and it's just a matter of deciding uh, on interpretation. Uh, so uh, the debate on the reign of Empress Xi, Xi uh, would be based on that. So the evidence is there, we know what she did and did not do as Empress, and then it's a matter of uh, opinion as to whether you think she was an old, declining, decadent Empress, or somebody who was more forward-looking. I'm not finished with the book yet, but I tend to be uh, not too convinced by the argument. Overall, China was kind of a downward slope. So to answer the overall question that we started with, how come Christopher Columbus was not Chinese? Uh, when large part, because the Chinese did not want to. Uh, they had a great head start, largest population in the world as of the 1400s, the best maritime technology, huge fleets under Zheng He, and somehow decided purposely uh, to stop that and to look more inward. In that sense, uh, the reason for the lack of Chinese development over the next few hundred years is a political decision. It's a, a lack of political leadership. Uh, which in a way uh, reminds me of what we had studied when studying uh, the Ottoman and the Mughal Empire in Turkey and India, uh, where there was a kind of a similar dynamic at play, uh, where from the top uh, there were rulers that were more interested in preserving their authority and stability at the expense of the kind of creative destruction uh, that is at the heart of democracy and capitalism. Put for thought there. How do great nations rise and fall? What makes some countries succeed and others not? I'll let you ponder those issues. See you next time.